Hello and welcome to an executive conversation on trust in tech. At Protocol, we look at technology as no longer just an industry, but a global power center with the sweep and impact of any nation's capital. Our focus is to arm you as decision makers in tech, business, and policy with unbiased, facts-based news and analysis needed to run your organizations and frankly, navigate the tech world in rapid change. Our job at Protocol is to not be pro or anti-tech, but rather to tell the really complex narratives of both the positive impact and sometimes the unintended consequences in this tech evolution. Like any power center, the role that trust plays in tech is not a small issue, particularly today. In many ways, it is now core to the conversation. I'm excited today to moderate a conversation with Edelman, who are in their 21st year of studying trust. And this year's and this year, the Edelman Trust Barometer has some really interesting data around tech and the state of trust. Please, across this hour, join us in this conversation by tweeting your questions at hashtag Edelman Trust. And to kick us off, please welcome Margot Edelman, General Manager of Edelman in the Bay Area. Margot has been a key leader at the firm for numerous years, including leading Edelman's tech practice. Margot, welcome. I'm going to kick this off with a few slides, um, and then I promise we'll get very quickly into discussion since um, anyone wants to have a slide deck for an hour. Um, so we'll get through all the data pretty quickly um, and then go straight into discussion uh, with some great other panelists. Uh, so as Tammy said, Edelman has been studying trust for 21 years, um, and this year's data had some really interesting findings in particular on the tech sector. Um, so let, let's dive right in. But what we can see very clearly is that trust is declining in the technology sector pretty dramatically this year. Um, so specifically what you'll see here is that the tech sector went from um, 77 points um, in you know, trust in tech globally in 2012 to 68 points um, in 2021. So that is a nine point drop where business in general went from 47 points in 2012 to 59 points in 2021. Um, so there's now, you know, uh, you know, a, a much shorter divide, gap or divide between the tech sector and business in general. And we can really see that tech is sort of losing this halo of trust that it used to have. Uh, but we can also see that there are a handful of countries that have had double digit declines in trust in tech since 2020, specifically China, Japan, Thailand, Brazil, and South Korea. Again, all of these double digit drops in trust in tech. Um, trust in tech has also reached all-time lows in 17 of 27 countries. Uh, and what you'll see here in particular on the right uh, is that many of the countries where tech has gone from being trusting to neutral is um, there, you know, in, in the developed world. So that's Germany, France, the U.S., the U.K., Japan. So in particular in the markets that many of us are communicating in on behalf of our clients or operating in, um, that's where there's actually increasingly low levels of trust in the tech sector. However, there are some countries, again, mainly in the developing world that still have pretty high levels of trust in tech. That's India, Saudi, UAE, even China. Um, but again, the developed world, the Western world, that's where you see trust in tech at a significant decline from what it used to be. And I think this slide in particular is really the money slide here. And that shows that in the U.S., the greatest decline in uh, trust um, it fell actually to ninth place out of all sectors. So in 2020, it was the most trusted sector in the US. Um, and in 2021, it fell to ninth place. Um, so now we see food and beverage, healthcare, transport, all have significantly higher levels of trust than the tech sector does, for example. And the tech sector is almost in line with financial services, which, you know, some of you guys remember the financial crisis used to have significantly lower levels of trust. So as you can see, um, tech really has a trust issue in particular in the United States. Um, and the pandemic has actually magnified tech-related fears. Um, and why is this? It's really because tech has accelerated fears of job loss. Uh, we asked the number of people 
uh, to say whether they agree um, with the statement, the pandemic will accelerate the rate at which companies will replace human workers with AI and robots. Um, and around the world, you know, basically the majority of people agreed with this. Um, and as we can see in the U.S., this actually went up by seven points um, to 53 percent agree with this. So, again, the pandemic has accelerated fears of job loss and fears of job loss in many ways we hypothesize are actually what's driving um, what's driving this fear um, of technology and this mistrust of technology. Um, so what do we do? Technology companies actually need to engage their employees to advance change. Um, so what's interesting is that employer trust is actually highest among tech sector employees. So we basically ask those who are employed in each of the following sectors if they trust their employer. Um, and tech is actually on par with financial services in that 83% of employees in the tech sector say they trust their employer. Um, this is you know, much higher than other sectors, although across the board, employees trust their own employee, employers more than they trust um, business overall and the different sectors their business is in. Um, also, tech employers are expected to be a trusted source of information. Um, so again, we asked, you know, I look to my employer to be a trustworthy source of information about social issues and other important topics on which there's not general agreement in our country today. And among all employees, 59% say they agree with this. Among tech employees, 68% say that they agree. So again, this is an important number um, just because again, it shows that if you're a tech company, you have an ability to actually educate your employees and to provide information for them about what's going on in the world. They want you to be an interpreter of the world at large um, and help them sort of parse through what's going on um, in the country and in the world. Um, this is also a really key slide. Tech employees are also more likely to speak out and protest at work. Um, among all employees, 50% said they are more likely now than a year ago to voice their objections to management or engage in workplace protest if I were to strongly disagree with an action or organization has taken or a policy they've implemented. And among tech companies, this is actually 59%, so it's much higher than the average. So this shows that if you are a tech company, your employees both can be your strongest advocates, but if they don't agree with you, they're going to step in and they're going to speak out, whether that's, you know, having a protest or that's just looking for another job, even that it's a hot economy. Um, they're not going to just sit back and let you kind of do what you want. So in conclusion, what we really believe is that tech needs a game change. Um, so what are some things that technology, the technology industry and tech companies need to do? This could be shared prosperity, for example, around automation, job skills in the economy. How do you, you know, Create an economy that allows everyone to participate rather than haves and have nots. That's codifying trust in tech. It's explaining um, what technology actually means. What does it do? What does AI actually consist of? Uh, that's focusing on diversity and innovation. It's allowing tech companies not just to be sort of a bunch of white men, um, but really allowing there to be a diversity of representation in the employees for tech companies, making sure that tech companies look like the world. Um, data and responsibility, making sure that privacy and security is taken care of for people. You know, tech companies have a huge amount of our data. It's ensuring that they take responsibility for that. A technology for social good, emphasizing the SDGs and innovation. And then finally, sustainable technology, focusing on the climate, focusing on ecosystems. So these are just some recommendations that we as at Allman have for what tech companies can do to continue to improve and build trust, given the place that we find ourselves in today. Um, and so with that, that's the conclusion of the presentation. I promise no more slides. Um, and we're gonna get right back into our panel. Thank you. Excellent. Margo, thank you so much. Really appreciate that overview. You've given us a lot to think about and chew on here. And I wanna welcome to the conversation, Chelsea Kohler and Tom Bosert. Uh, Chelsea has recently joined the Pill Club as the Senior Vice President of Communications and Public Affairs but has previously been at the Center of Communications and Product Conversations at Uber, Facebook, and Google. Welcome, Chelsea. And Tom is the president of Trinity Cyber, an advanced network threat prevention tech company, and a national security analyst for ABC News. And previously, as many of you know, Tom served as the assistant to, the pres to President Trump for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism. 
Chelsea, let's dive in and let's start at the highest level, right? Margot just walked through kind of where trust uh, appears to be in tech, but trust is a complicated issue, right? It means different things to different communities, consumers, partners, policymakers. You've seen this movie at a lot of tech companies. How do you define trust and why do you think it's potentially declining? Thank you so much for having me, Tammy. I'm so glad to join everyone today. Yes, uh, I've seen the movie a few times and I think Today, at least in corporate context, trust is what happens when what you do and say is a brand aligned with what your customer is feeling and experiencing. So I think what Margo, some of those trends Margo is talking about are when people um, hear companies talking about their missions as if they're nonprofits with really lofty goals that a lot of the time, by the way, I believe are weighted in true intentions of wanting to do good, um, but then experience the tech not being reliable, the company not being transparent, um, or maybe doubting that the company is focused on the greater good. Um, and to the points Margot just showed us, we also know these attitudes are driven by fear. So I'm, I wonder, I'm really interested to see 2022's findings and that uh, I believe that we may see attitude shift as society reopens a bit more and people are able to see the benefits of tech's sustained innovation and the economic growth that the industry continues to drive. You know, at the Pill Club, we're earning the trust of hundreds of thousands of women every month uh, at a really personal level with their personal health history as we provide contraception. And that's why we made the decision. I think what some tech companies can all do is think about what parts of the experience can they own? Uh, for example, we have in-house medical team, in-house pharmacy, we're packing the boxes, um, which really helps us control the experience and continue to earn members trust. So I think that's a way all companies can think about how to earn trust of their customers over time. And I also think there's um, when there's a new category, it takes time for people to learn to trust, not just the company, but sort of the concept to begin with, right? When it came to search, we learned over time that when you type a question into Google, the results are gonna be accurate. The address that you're looking for um, or the answer to the health question is going to be accurate. With Uber, you learned you could hit a button, press a button, and get a ride to the airport and make your flight. So sometimes it also takes time. And we're certainly seeing that with telemedicine. Uh, our first users were digital natives at the Pill Club. Uh, people, women who are used to having products on demand uh, and don't have an issue with direct-to-consumer companies, even for health. And the pandemic has, has accelerated. Well, it's exposed the need to break down barriers around healthcare. But I think it's also had you know, everyone's probably experienced this year a medical appointment done online that they used to do in person. Uh, so I think this year will be a really interesting one to see how folks feel about tech in a year's time because there's so much potential still, I think, uh, for tech to do a lot of good. Awesome. Tom, uh, cybersecurity is in, entirely built on the concept of trust, right? One of the pieces of protocol we believe is that tech is not monolithic. And so when you think about cybersecurity, how do you think differently about building trust uh, now that you're in tech versus the government? Like, why do you think it's potentially declined across tech? Tammy, you know, I, I was in government when nobody trusted government institutions, and now I'm in, in tech and no one's trusting tech. I, I'm, I'm worried it's me. Uh, <laughs> what I thought was interesting before we, we, we answer that directly is the trend analysis that Margot just set up. What we saw, and, and that Chelsea just commented on with fear, what we saw in that special kind of mid-year uh, trust barometer from Edelman was an increase in trust in government. Joking aside, that was a pretty in significant finding. That meant people were fearful. Of course, we're in the middle of a pandemic. They're worried about their lives. And they begin to trust the institutions that employ the doctors and the scientists that are, you know, are going to save their lives and prevent loss. And now as we retreat and, 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 you know, I know it's not over yet, but as we see the light at the end of the tunnel of COVID, people are going back to their distrust of government authority. So, you know, to the I made, I can't wait to see what the future holds. Uh, clearly people can change their view and change their ability to trust. I'll tell you though, it happened once in that 21 years that government trust went up and then right back down. So it's, it's something that we shouldn't take lightly. The corollary of trust is fear, but the corollary of fear is retreat. And so I guess, uh, let me answer your question on cybersecurity. Fear is at a, as an all-time high, uh, but there is no option for retreat. So much like Chelsea, we've got a, a company that has a clear purpose, that's important. We have clear you know, goals, that's important for our customers and our employees. 
We're transparent about our incentive structure. That's important. But we're still small enough that we've got customer intimacy. And for large enterprise solutions, especially those that provide cybersecurity at scale, that's incredibly difficult to hang on to. So you start to distrust people that you don't know, that you don't see on a regular basis, that you don't think have your best interest at heart just because uh, that you don't have any, any daily interaction with them. So how do I see it? I see cybersecurity uh, is a little bit flat right now. There's, there, there's a slow innovation cycle while human beings, not you know technology, is exploiting vulnerabilities or are exploiting vulnerabilities. We've got tools and institutions that are a little bit slower than those human beings at keeping up and keeping pace. So um, to be honest, I'm starting to see trust in government and trust in cybersecurity coming into alignment. And I think that's an indicator of an early bellwether that people are willing to trust authority a little bit more because they're not seeing the results that they wanted from industry. Interesting. Um, let's dive into a couple of more of these themes, Margo, that you and, and the barometer highlighted. You know, one of the findings uh, when I was reviewing the Trust Barometer report is certainly this distinction between how folks are feeling about general business versus technology businesses. And at the same time, we see this kind of rise of what many people are calling stakeholder capitalism. Uh, business leaders, including tech leaders, being asked to kind of weigh in on not just their businesses and technology innovations, but societal issues. Um, and I'm wondering, how do you think that this is help or hurting tech com companies in building trust? And are there any specific examples that any of you can give um, to either side of that? Margo, let's Sure. I mean, I, I personally think it's it's helping to build trust. I mean, I, I think that the fact that companies, um, company leadership are now weighing in on voting rights, um, you know, for example, in the U.S. South, I think I think it's a great thing. I mean, these are biases that people have held for a really long time. And I think it's a great thing that business leaders are stepping up um, to basically put pressure on government to, to make really necessary changes. Um, I think, you know, to me, things like that are, you know, positive and, you know, should be helping to build trust. I think on the tech side specifically, initiatives um, that companies like Salesforce have taken, for example, to invest in the San Francisco community um, or initiatives like Google and Microsoft around reskilling and retraining workers um, to have jobs in today's economy. Again, I think are all things that will help to you know, help to build trust. It's not just these sort of, you know, tech CEOs sitting in their ivory towers, you know, collecting their checks and these companies being able to, you know, whether it's investing in their community or investing in, you know, retraining people, you know, they're really focused on helping to, it's not to say, but helping to make the world a better place um, and helping to make sure that society's, you know, transitioning, um, you know, accordingly. So I, I personally think it's a good thing and it's, you know, helping to build trust in companies. Kelsey, Tom, other other thoughts or examples where you think it's either helping or frankly confusing us in terms of trust? Well, you know, yeah, I agree. Go ahead, Chelsea, please. I was just going to chime in and, and say that, you know, as Margo noted, there's definitely this new brand of corporate activism that I think makes the most sense to me when a leader is couching their point of view or sort of up leveling it and relating it to policies that affect them. So I think, you know, um, Larry Fink's letter about sustainable investing at BlackRock comes to mind, or you know, at the Pill Club, we think about women with limited access to healthcare and try to link back what we're supportive of um, and speaking out about to you know the services we provide. But you know, as Margot noted, I think there've been, especially over the last four years, certainly some moments where um, it's not only the right thing to do to stand up, but it's also sort of good for business to stand up and and share your point of view. Yeah, Larry's letter is a great example, right? You know, he's got to invest at scale across a number of companies. He can't control all of them. So he wants to put forth some type of you know, overarching umbrella of expectation. Uh, that's great. I guess I would say there is an obvious downside. If we start to expect our CEOs to weigh in on issues that are not related, even tangentially to our core purpose uh, as a company, as the team gets up every day looking for you know, they want to know their boss is doing the right thing, but looking for stability and growth and all the things that we also want in our in our jobs. Uh, I'm all for it. You know, as long as it's as long as it's done in a way that doesn't bite us. You know, sometimes we end up with this kind of social activism driving a wedge between us instead of finding a constructive solution. 
when I'm critical of a government policy in a leadership role, I try to couch my criticism in a constructive way that says, I don't agree with that policy. I think we should pursue a different one. And here's why. And for me, at least, I find that gets me more credibility to explain my rationale than to take the actual end position. People can quibble with my ultimate conclusions, but as long as I explain my rationale and keep it relevant without being unnecessarily petty or divisive or having some ulterior motive, then we're in the right place and people can choose to work for the right companies who are led by the right people that are interested in doing what's right more than making you know an extra nickel of profit. Yeah, um, I appreciate but all of those perspectives on it. And, and we are actually at protocol having an, another event specifically on that topic later in April that I hope uh, you all will join us for. I want to turn uh, to the to the huge piece that you talked about, um, Margo, around employees and building trust with employees. Uh, you know, in, in Protocol's recent tech employee pulse survey, we saw very similar uh, data to what you presented, which is we saw really mixed reactions, candidly, from employees. And a couple pieces from ours, we saw that while over 80% that said that big tech is too powerful, yet more than 68% wanted their companies to partner or be acquired by big tech. On the same side, very similar to you, we saw that over 80% said that they believe their leaders and managers in tech companies have employees' best interests in mind. So one of the pieces, Margo, that you dove into is this concern and decline of trust over potential job loss due to yep. technology innovation. How do you think about, talk, what do you, how do you advise companies on that and, and in terms of how they think about that and communicate around that issue, particularly with employees? Um, no, that, that's a great question. I mean, I think it's different when you're talking to your own employees versus when you're talking sort of at large, just because presumably if you're, you know, you're talking to your own employee base, you know, you're thinking through, okay, you know, with most of them, you know, you're going to continue to work with the company, you have a career path for those maybe where jobs are changing, you have reskilling programs um, within your own companies. Um, I do think for us, when we're, we're communicating, you know, or advising our companies, our clients on how to communicate it really is that focus on job retraining and reskilling. Um, that that's so important. Um, both, I think, you know, within within a company's employee base, you know, showing options for, you know, how can they progress through the company, um, and how can they sort of train themselves for the job they might want to have in three to four years, not necessarily the job they have now. But then also, what are they doing in the community? It's not just about their own employee base. It's also about, you know. What are they doing, um, you know, in the communities in which they operate to help train people for the jobs of tomorrow? Um, and I think something that's actually really interesting also today is looking at things from more of a skills or just sort of skills based versus degree based. Um, and you know, for example, companies are moving more towards hiring people based on the skills they have versus the degree they have, which I think is a very interesting shift as well. And hopefully, opens up new opportunities for people who may not not have gone to X Y Z name brand school. Um, so I think that's a very interesting communication shift as well. Yeah, huge, huge shift and huge conversation around kind of skills base and, and frankly, the evolving nature of the workplace. Chelsea, you've now seen, uh, you know, this from large companies um, and now, you know, at the pill oven in terms of an early growth company. How do you think differently about how you engage with employees on building trust uh, than you maybe did, you know, 10 years ago? Well, I think you're getting to the point that employee expectations have changed dramatically over the past decade. And I think the lines between internal communications and, and what you say on the inside and what you say on the outside are, should essentially be pretty close together because um, that line is really blurred. I think that's ultimately a good thing. Uh, there's a lot more accountabilities for leadership as a result. I think at the same time, leadership from the start uh, should be super clear about what everyone's working towards, because I think eventually as a company gets bigger, and you know, right now uh, people at Pill Club still use first names, um, and one day there'll be two Chelsea's at the company. And when that happens, people do need to have managed expectations around the visibility they're gonna have into every decision. I think I've seen that at other companies when they reach the adolescence around um, M&A starting to occur or a quiet period around going public. And I think that's incumbent on companies to really educate everyone on the team about the reasons behind, not just sort of what the law says, uh, but also the importance of the business doing worse if 100% of information shared all the time. But um, that really starts with 
uh, to your point, being as transparent as possible from the beginning about what people will know and what they can't be, you know, what they can't know. And that withholding information sometimes is only to protect everyone and including the business. Yeah. Tom, what's your perspective on this, especially kind of in the cyber world, et cetera, around privacy and, and you know, how, how is the role of this, you know, the CEO evolved in terms of internal comms versus external comms and bringing employees around? Is it different in cyber? You know, it's a little bit different, uh, but there's a few things that are the same. And I want to I want to kind of merge that question with the last one. So we talk about jobs and we talk about upskilling a lot. I've been a big proponent of that. Of course, most of us have. But I'd like to introduce another concept, and that is professional development, <laughs> because it leads to increased wages. So at this stage, I'm not as worried about jobs. Of course, we want everyone that wants to work to have an, uh, an available job. But as we look at the data, what we're seeing is a hollowed out middle class of people that can find work, but not work at a wage that they want and not work at a wage that you could justify for their particular level of training or skills. So when we upskill someone, we focus often on the training component of professional development. You kind of train somebody to replicate. I'd like to also focus on educating them and on giving them joint or, or, or more expansive experiences. The idea of experiences, education, and training being brought together isn't just about grooming a better future leadership pool. It's about making a better feeder pool. You know, you'll end up with a better uh, colonel, not just a bunch of better generals. And the idea there uh, lends itself to this trust dialogue between leadership. I spend a lot of time talking to my employee base about how and when they're going to get to the point where they take my job and what they'll need to do that, not just about our purpose as a company, but about their, their kind of taking grasp of what they need to do for their careers. And a lot of times, surprisingly, what I hear from them is, my career won't put me into your job unless I leave this company and come back to it. And that's always something that we've got to wrap our heads around. But on the privacy front, uh, I actually see that as, a, as, as, an important, as an important quality, privacy, but also as something that's in that corollary I mentioned earlier. So fear leads to retreat often. A lot of people have retreated into privacy, just like they do at a macro scale into nationalism. You know, when things look awfully complex and they don't understand how they work, they say, well, let me just exclude any institution or any tech company from my day-to-day -day life. I don't trust anything or anybody. Uh, I understand the instinct, but we can overcome that concern or that instinct and reaction with some education, not just with training. And then with giving people a broader set of experiences, it better rounds them and it better allows them to make decisions for their own data, their own privacy, what tools they do and don't trust. Uh, often I find that you can't really just teach somebody. You've got to let them learn and you've got to give them that latitude to go and, and find the experiences to get around them. Yeah, I, in some ways you touched on what I, what I wanted to dig in here, back to our stakeholder capitalism conversation. I mean, I think everyone here has kind of talked about like what the talking points are around kind of bringing employees along. But as tech leaders, that actually have to go execute that. There's been a lot of conversation about like, well, we should be providing professional, tech leaders should be weighing in on lots of issues, providing professional development, reskilling, you know, all of these things um, for large, large companies are potentially doable. Tech is not monolithic, everyone's not a unicorn. So I guess my question is like, is that is that true across all tech? You know, that should everyone be saying like, yes, we can afford and we can be doing all of these things? You know, are there any nuances, Margo, that, you know, or others that you have seen about where sometimes you can't say that and um, and there is an implication on trust, but that's the reality of kind of running a business. Um, I mean, I, I definitely hear you that, you know, you have to run a business, you have to do what's necessary to make the business run, but I don't think that should necessarily impact a company's ability to build trust. I think, as I talked about sort of in the presentation, there are a number of sort of trust building behaviors um, that companies can do, um, you know, that you, you know, as a company should do, obviously, in addition to talking about your share price and your growth strategy. I mean, increasingly, you know, companies are being asked to talk about, okay, what's their DEI commitments? What's their commitments on um, climate? What are their commitments in the communities in which they operate? What are their commitments on reskilling and retraining workers? Um, so there's a lot, or what's their commitments on supply chain? 
So there's so much more than just, you know, the share price today that companies need to be communicated about. And I think once a company recognizes that, I think that's a way to build trust um, rather than sort of just saying, okay, I'm only going to talk about my share price and everything else, you know, maybe it's going to be the chief sustainability officer, whatever else. No, it's the job of sort of the leadership team of the company to, to be communicating about these things. And I think the Larry Finkbutter um, is an incredible example of that. I, I, you know, somebody who's, you know, clearly a huge leader in their field, really embracing this idea of stakeholder capitalism, putting a stake in the ground and, and taking the business there. Um, awesome. Yeah, it's, it's complex, and I appreciate you guys going into the nuances of that. Let's turn our attention from employees to, uh, to government. Um, we, uh, we cannot talk about trust in tech without talking about the increasing intersection and what appears, based on the barometer, as a distrust between Washington and tech. Uh, it shows that people believe business should actively partner with government um, and we've had a whole host in, in the Washington DC of congressional hearings with big tech CEOs most recently asking questions on lots of different topics. I'm interested in each of your perspective on what tech and tech leaders are doing well in working with, in collaboration with government. I wanna start with what, what they're doing well potentially um, and then understand kind of some of the nuances uh, after that. So Chelsea, I'd love to, to start with you and then go around the horn. Sure, I think, you know, it's any company, I know there was a stat in the survey, in your employee survey that showed that 40% of those survey agreed, you know, big tech and government maybe shouldn't be partnering. And I think that's almost impossible for any company that's at scale, right? Or even at a mid-sized company. And at Uber, obviously our relationship with government's evolved over time. And I'm really proud of the action we took to publish a first of its kind safety report in 2019. And I think, you know, what we learned, heard loud and clear from riders and drivers was that they wanted, this is back to the previous topic, for a large global company to take a stand and work with government because it would be more quick, like would be quicker and more effective to drive change in terms of transparency and publishing data around incidents and working with like-minded peers versus competing with them to solve these common problems we had. And I think there's been a narrative for a generation or more that government needs to be careful about regulating around tech to avoid stifling innovation. And that's true to a point, but the, it's also true that uh, in the end that leads to the vacuum we're seeing and, and maybe some of the action we're seeing on the Hill now. So I think it's really incumbent on, you know, all tech companies to be working actively with policymakers to explain and step in and act when government inaction constrains innovation, uh, creates untenable risks for the communities we serve, or where this inaction sort of allows digital real world harm to flourish. So for example, you know, at the Pill Club, we're looking at how Medicaid coverage of telemed over the pandemic is something we would love to see extended, right? And so I think explaining and showing, we can't expect uh, members of Congress to know what we do day to day. It's incumbent on us to share that information and, and educate government rather than perhaps critique it. Yeah. Tom, th thoughts? Well, you know, I wish I could say they're doing better, uh, but I, I, I like what Chelsea just said. You know, I don't want to add to it, but I don't see a lot of uh, um, a lot of goodwill negotiating. I see a lot of begrudging commitment and collaboration only if you're drug into a certain environment. So I heard this from a tech leader recently. They said, what can we do? We have a complex business. Nobody in Washington bothers to learn how it works. And, you know, until they can figure out how it works, they can't have an informed opinion. Well, I completely agree. Uh, but I would I would note two trends. One is almost irrefutable. I, I'd be happy to have a viewer tell me where I'm wrong. I've never seen a law or a regulation lead societal change. They always follow. And so at this stage, if we could, if we could just work out, and I'm part of a number of efforts where we try to work this out, a common definition of the problem we're trying to fix, I think we'd be in a really a much better place. Social platforms have their own unique challenges and we've all debated to, Section 230 quite a bit. There's a lot of other, a lot of other companies in tech, yeah, to your point, Tammy, we've got you know, not a monolithic industry and it's, it's extremely unclear to me what problem it is that we're trying or problems it is we're trying to fix in most of the debates around cybersecurity. Uh, we just want better and faster. And that's okay, but we need to do a little bit better at defining what better and what faster means. 
what it is that we're trying to address. And then, you know, we can perhaps try some novel experimentation that's not driven by government. If we wait for a consensus federal compulsion, uh, we can wait out the clock uh, on a lot of different administrations and we can put off a lot of reforms. But instead, if we all agree on the problem, I find most of the big tech industry and small tech, uh, they're going to come out with solutions on their own. And then government's going to say, yeah, I like that one. The one that you just tried there, that's that was a good one. We, we're going to enshrine that one in, in rule uh, and we're going to get rid of the other bad experiments. I don't, I, don't see us, I don't see us being there right now, unfortunately. I wish we were. But I guess if anybody's listening that's from big tech and thinking, well, we can ride out you know, another four years or kind of, you know, kind of just play along these congressmen that don't understand what's going on, you're probably right to some degree. But I would caution against that strategy. This trust barometer shows that whatever we're doing isn't working. Margo, you've, you've been watching this trust information for a long time now. What, what is this intersection of government and tech right now? Uh, it's not just public hearings, right? So how are you thinking about this with your with your clients? Absolutely. I mean, I think something that we at Edelman talk about a lot is the, the need to almost over-communicate. Um, so it's, it's better, as you know, we talked about earlier, to, to get ahead of the issue. Um, so don't wait for a government to come in and say, this is what you need to do X, Y, Z company. It's to understand what are, what are the potential hot button issues you're going to be faced by with government. And it's different with every, you know, new president that comes in or, you know, new, you know, um, prime minister, for example, for the UK, et cetera. Um, but really understanding, okay, what is the landscape that I'm operating in? What are these sort of hot button issues going to be? And then how do I get out ahead of it? How do I sort of communicate about what I'm doing? Um, you know, in, in these different core areas that government's going to care about, um, whether that is job creation, whether that's um, sustainability, whether that's regulation around data privacy and security, understanding what these issues are and almost over communicating, um, and then partnering with government to, to understand how to change the laws um, or, or make regulations um, in a way that sort of helps to find a middle ground, um, just because as, as Tom, you know, very well said. It's if you if you wait, um, you might not necessarily like what you're going to get, and you're you know operating you know in a landscape of regulators who might not necessarily. Um, so again, you know, I mean, I'm a comms professional, so maybe this is this makes sense coming from me. But I do think the more um, the more companies can communicate, um, and the more companies can partner, um, the better. You know, it's an interesting, you know, we, we spent this time talking about Washington specifically. I think if, you know, as, as you look at protocols coverage of this, at this intersection between where tech is, it's not just a federal conversation, right? Lots of work happening and lots of communication happening at the state level. Chelsea, you saw that at Uber. Um, lots at the local level, too. There's a lot of things that tech leaders are, are having to kind of balance right now. And, and I don't want to end the event with actually not just looking at the U.S. context. Margot, I think you presented a lot of data that was much more global to this trend around trust in tech. Um, and, you know, we at Protocol have been really, really focused on this specifically in a belief that you, for us to cover tech, you can't just cover U.S. tech. And so that's part of the launch of our Protocol China um, division is to really focus on what's happening in Chinese tech. Based on the barometer, it appears that trust in technology is down globally, not just in the U.S., but if I read it right, with the largest dip actually in China. I'd love to hear you, all of you kind of wrap up in, in many cases with some perspective of how much of what we've talked about today applies globally or whether you think that there's nuances. Um, and so, you know, Chelsea, let's start with you and we'll go around. Sure. You know, I think, well, I think that U.S. tech companies have some of the brightest minds in the world. I'm sure we all agree on that. And I'm really cheered by some smaller companies continuing to innovate and challenge the status quo uh, and make lives better. And I think in the global context, um, you know, if I'm a leader of any U.S. tech company, it's really about illustrating the positive benefits at at the local level to the point you just brought up. Right. So at Uber, you know, obviously we had these regulatory fights um around the world but we were also illustrating the reduction of drunk driving in all these places uh and i think the pill club obviously it's a u.s focused company but talking about the potential for telemedicine to reach more people who are you know more than an hour from a pharmacy and a doctor is really powerful so i think you know no matter where your company sits being able to sort of up level and discuss the impact 
um, and talk about the potential for that globally, even if you're just headquartered in, in California or uh, expanding in the, in the moment is really powerful. Tom, thoughts about this idea of global trust and what that means for, for companies not based here in the US or frankly what US tech companies should be doing internationally as well? Uh, it's probably something that's consumed more of my time over the last three or four <laughs> years than, than any other question. And uh, I don't see it. I don't see uh, a, a coexistence of different economic, political and social systems and cultures. Uh, as we see tech making decisions, I used to ask all the tech leaders I interacted with, and I still interact with, would you rather do the right thing and keep all of your Western business, or would you rather compromise what you think is right and gain market share in a, an autocratic nation? And it's a tough one because almost everyone reflexively says, well, I want both. I'll figure out a way to do both. <laughs> uh, but increasingly, that's becoming more difficult. And so I think companies at the bottom line are going to have to make some, some trust-based decisions on what's right and wrong. I've never called for a decoupling of our economies between China and the United States, but I have uh, concluded that we're going to have to decouple on some core infrastructure like, like chip manufacturing. Uh, very difficult to, to sort out how to trust a chip manufacturer in the place uh, that doesn't operate under the same rules and systems that, that we operate under. So, you know, a full decoupling destabilizes society. So sometimes we have to work with people we don't trust, uh, but we try to limit that. So I don't see it as being easy, uh, but I see Microsoft and Apple and others have been on the forefront of learning the, the hard way, how difficult it is to work in different cultures and societies. Uh, I'm pretty buoyed uh, by the current administration's approach. I hope that, or you know, I hope to continue what I, what I believe is their approach of trying to split that difference. Uh, but at the end of the day, if I can, just to for fear of not having a, another opportunity to say it, uh, trust is, is pretty hard to earn and really hard to keep, but you can lose it in an instant. And so I always repeat these rules to, to whoever wants to hear them. But you have to tell people everything you know. You have to tell them what you don't know. You have to acknowledge uncertainty. And you have to explain the rationale behind your decisions. If you do those things, you keep public trust, whether it's in an emergency or in a corporation whether it's employees or customers, people ultimately react to those rules if you can stick to them. It's a good thing to live by. It's a better thing to, to run your organization by. But none of that's really a leadership instinct. All of that's about keeping and maintaining trust and earning it. If you really want to be a leader, you're going to have to paint a picture of what the future is going to look like and what the future might hold. And I think those are two quite different things. Mm -hmm. so for tech people here, for tech industry communicators that want to maintain trust, I gave you the list of things you have to do. But if you want to really paint a picture of what the future looks like and be a leader, you're going to have to take some risk. And that includes your employees walking out on you or your customers being upset or your investors feeling a little bit you know, out of joint. Uh, but that leadership decision is on the individual leadership of the company, not on the communications team around them. Margo, bring us home here uh, on the global perspective, but also in terms of as we as we wrap up here, anything different on the global perspective? Um, I do think it's interesting looking at um, trust in sort of the developed world versus the developing world um, in technology, just because in the developed world, um, technology at this point are, you know, robots taking my jobs, um, whereas in the developing world, it's, you know, I got a phone um, or I have a computer or I have access to Internet. So I do think, you know, there is a stark difference between what technology can provide um, and what even the word technology might mean between sort of the developed world and developing world. So I do think that that might be some of the, you know, the reason behind the differentials in trust, um, you know, globally. Um, but, you know, and, and again, going back to sort of the U.S. versus China, it is pretty fascinating how sort of just completely different internets have developed um, in China versus the U.S. It really almost like is like there's two different ecosystems um, that exist, you know, in some ways from a technology perspective completely independently um, from each other. So that's, you know, a, you know, a little bit of an aside, but it's just fascinating working in the tech industry and seeing that, um, you know, China has just completely its own world. So I understand why you're developing protocol China makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, but no, I mean, it really, it really was fascinating just to see the extent to which trust has dropped um, this year, and I mean, one of the slides that wasn't in there was the trust in tech actually went up uh, when we did our May 2020 survey and then significantly dropped um, from May to January. So this is not just a year long phenomenon, this is a pandemic uh, phenomenon. And, um, you know, again, very likely related to fear of job loss, 
um, you know, fear of, um, you know, that my, that my future will not be as bright as, as my past was. Um, and that technology is no longer the industry that's helping me. It's the industry that's keeping me out of a job. Um, so again, I just want to reiterate that it's incumbent on the tech industry to understand that, um, to work with regulators, to, you know, think about themselves in the light of sort of stakeholder capitalism um, versus just sort of shareholder um, benefits and, and to operate accordingly um, in order to sort of rebuild their, their place as the number one trusted industry and as sort of the industry with that halo that they're, they do good in the world. Excellent. Uh, well, I want to thank uh, Chelsea, Tom, Margot. Thank you so much for helping to put context around uh, the Edelman Trust Barometer here, specifically to tech. And, and thanks to our the entire Edelman team for making this possible. Uh, I hope that this is a continuing conversation, and we look forward to seeing the data the next time it comes out and seeing if if tech is is moving in what direction next. Um, so, thank you again to all of you who joined us. We hope that you will continue to follow this issue. And, and the topic of tech as a power center at protocol.com. We'll see you soon. Thanks, everybody.